Hello, Alhambra True Light Presbyterian Church. Uh, before we uh, begin, I want to just make a couple of announcements. First of all, if you could just be looking for us uh, online each Sunday, uh, the office will send you a link in connections each week. Also, we are working on ways for you to make your offering <laughs> electronically. We're not there yet. Uh, we'll keep you posted on our progress. Uh, for now, we just ask that you would please uh, use the postal service and mail your offering to the church uh, address at 20 West Commonwealth Avenue, Alhambra, California, 91801. Or, if you like, you can drop it in the mail slot located at our office entrance uh, facing Commonwealth Avenue. So, for today, I hope to encourage you with this psalm, Psalm 57. I'd like to read uh, this psalm now to you, Psalm 57, reading to you from the New International Version. Have mercy on me, O God, have mercy on me, for in you my soul takes refuge. I will take refuge in the shadow of your wings until the disaster has passed. I cry out to God, Most High, to God who fulfills his purpose for me. He sends from heaven and saves me, rebuking those who hotly pursue me. God sends his love and his faithfulness. I am in the midst of lions. I lie among ravenous beasts men whose teeth are spears and arrows, whose tongues are sharp swords. Be exalted, O God, above the heavens. Let your glory be over all the earth. They spread a net for my feet. I was bowed down in distress. They dug a pit in my path, but they have fallen into it themselves. My heart is steadfast, O God. My heart is steadfast. I will sing and make music. Awake, my soul. Awake, harp and lyre. I will awake, I will awaken the dawn. I will praise you, O Lord, among the nations. I will sing of you among the peoples. For great is your love reaching to the heavens. Your faithfulness reaches to the skies. Be exalted, O God, above the heavens. Let your glory be over all the earth. Let us pray. Lord, guide us wherever we are to experience your presence, that we might praise you as sincerely as David. And may the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable to you through Jesus Christ our Lord, in whose name we pray. Amen. Uh, well, uh, have you seen this? Here, let me get a picture of it here. Have you seen this, right? Hmm. Yes, you've probably seen it now about a thousand times. The COVID-19 uh, virus, the coronavirus, the creepy looking and potentially deadly coronavirus. It can, uh, according to one study, it can hang around on plastic surfaces for up to three days, uh, shorter on uh, metal surfaces. And it's causing all of us to take refuge. We're waiting for it to just go away. Uh, that's our situation is we're all in refuge. Look at David's situation. He was also waiting for a disaster to pass by. Uh, and he has something important to say about taking refuge. And I encourage you to look with me at it today. Look at verse 1. Have mercy on me, O God. Have mercy on me, for in you my soul takes, takes refuge. I will take refuge in the shadow of your wings until the disaster has passed. To understand the psalm a little better, look at the title. Look in the title. David wrote this. It says, 
He wrote this when he had fled from Saul into the cave. So you can read about this episode in, um, you can read about it in 1 Samuel uh, chapter 24, this part of David's life. When Saul was king, uh, he wanted to kill David because God had anointed David to be king in Saul's place. And David was hiding from him in the desert, uh, staying in a desolate cave, uh, waiting for uh, Saul and his men to go away. Saul and about 3,000 men who were seeking his life there nearby. We're all kind of like that right now, hiding out, hoping the coronavirus will just get tired and go away, get tired of looking for us and just give up. Saul and his army outnumbered David and his men about five to one. Uh, he was well armed. Uh, they were on the run. They were tired. They were hungry. Saul's army was well supplied, ready to go the distance. David was greatly outnumbered. COVID-19, in a way, seems to have the world outnumbered. The smallest amount can be deadly. What was David's response to the threat upon him? And what should ours be? Well, David shows us how we should see God as our refuge. Seeing God as your refuge. David sees God this way, as his place of safety. Look at the first line of this very first verse. David cries out for mercy to God in his circumstances. Have mercy on me, God, for in you my soul takes refuge. David's cry for mercy shows us that when you trust in God, you can take refuge in him. In any circumstance, whether it's King Saul or King COVID-19 or just the plain old generic everyday strife of life, it makes no difference. It is a simple but easy point to miss. God will give refuge to you, but... And here's the catch. Here's the fine print. You actually have to believe in him. Yes. It is exactly as we learn in Hebrews chapter 11, verse 6. I've been in Hebrews a lot, really influenced by it. Listen to Hebrews 11, chapter 11, verse 6. Without faith, it is impossible to please God because anyone who comes to him must believe he exists and that he rewards those who earnestly seek him. You remember the example that Jesus gives us in Luke uh, 18 when he was talking about these two people, the story of the Pharisee and the tax collector. Uh, turn to Luke 18 and look at it with me for a moment. It'll help us to understand what David is saying here, and what this call for mercy, what it comes out of. Look at Luke chapter 18, verse 9. To some who were confident of their own righteousness and looked down upon everybody else, Jesus told this parable. Two men went up to the temple to pray, one a Pharisee and one a tax collector. The Pharisee stood and prayed about himself, God. I thank you that I'm not like the other men, robbers, evildoers, adulterers, or even like this tax collector. I fast twice a week and give a tenth of all I get. But the tax collector stood at a distance. He would not even look up to heaven, but beat his breast and said, God, have mercy on me a sinner. Jesus says, I tell you that this man, rather than the other, went home justified before God. For everyone who exalts himself will be humbled, and he who humbles himself will be exalted. Now, look at verse 11 of this reading from Luke 18. The, uh, the NIV says that he prayed uh, about himself. Uh, the Pharisee prayed about himself. The New American Standard says to himself. The King James Version says 
with himself. Any way you want to translate it, it's always the same. Himself, himself, himself. He was stuck in his own horizontal world, considering himself, comparing himself, and comforting himself. But the tax collector, he is in another realm entirely. He is sensible that he is in the presence of God. And in that presence, he is made fully aware of who he is and his condition. Look, it even says he stood at a distance, it says in verse 13. So, you know, we're making sure these days we don't get too close to others. Uh, we keep our distance because of this virus that uh, we might have or others might have. The tax collector, you see, is sensible of the presence of God. So sensible that he will not even look up to heaven. He knows how infected he really is. And he cries out, exactly as David, God, have mercy on me, a sinner. And God gives him, just as God gave to David, just as God will give to you, just as God will give to anyone who believes in him, God will give you refuge in himself. God is our refuge. David uh, sees God as his refuge. He is sensible of God's presence, whatever circumstances he is in, and especially in these circumstances. So it's, it's seeing God as your refuge. And then the other thing is that it's seeing God as your refuge, but it's, all, it's also seeing God in your refuge. David sees God in his refuge. What I mean is that the things he is experiencing cause him to see God's care for him. Look at the next part of the verse. I will take refuge in the shadow of your wings until the disaster has passed. Now, if you read about this in 1 Samuel uh, 24, you find out that David and his men, it tells us there, were far back hiding in this cave. Uh, for David, uh, the cave, though, is not his refuge from Saul. It just reminds him, I think, that his real refuge is God. God is his refuge. For David, the darkness that is keeping everyone from seeing him is not, is not his protection. No, the darkness reminds him that he is in the shadow, not of the cave, but in the shadow of God's wings. That's what he says. He's talking about God's care. Of course, God doesn't have wings, but he's, what he means there is he's under, he senses in these shadows that he is in the shadow of God Almighty under his protection. Now, looking at things from a human point of view, and for all practical purposes, these guys are trapped. They're outnumbered. But the cave, the darkness, in all these circumstances, Dave, uh, David is sensible of the hand of God, of the providence of God, and of God's care. So you see, it's not just enough for me to say, to glibly say, or to agree with the idea that God is at work, uh, that God is... Uh, that these things are in God's hands. That is not enough to simply say or to believe that. Unless we believe that God is working in the details of whatever crisis we are in. Unless we believe that God is working in the details of every part of my life. Unless I believe that, unless I see God in my circumstances. Well, belief in him, what is it really? It's just intellectual assent. There's nothing experiential about it. But David is sensible of God being uh, in these things. So he sees God in his circumstances. There's um, a, a, an old uh, English Presbyterian preacher, Charles Simeon. Listen to what he said, and I'm going to read this, um, and then I'll, I'll make a comment about it. He says this, Charles Simeon said this once, he said, to mark the dispensations of providence and grace is good, but it will be of little service unless we mark the perfections of God as displayed in his dealings with 
us. Simeon was right on it there. We have to see God displayed in his dealings with us. We need to believe that, and it takes some practice. We have to work at it, but it's acknowledging his presence and his working in all of the things around us. Look around your refuge right now, wherever you are. Look at your life. Look at your circumstances, even when they are difficult. Look at your family. Look at your relationships. Look at your friends. Look at your church. Look at your struggles, your troubles, your sickness, your sorrows, and mark the perfections of God that he displays in his dealings with you. That is what David is doing, and that is what the scriptures encourage us to do. And then we can say, we can go on in this psalm as David does. He says, I cry out to God most high, to God who fulfills his purpose for me. He sends from heaven and saves me, rebuking those who hotly pursue me. God sends his love and faithfulness. To God who fulfills his purpose for me. For God who pursues, who fulfills his purpose for you. His purpose for me. When you really believe in him, uh, you can, if I might put it this way, you might finally, finally believe in yourself, if I could put it that way. I mean, he knows who you are. You don't. But he does, and you can believe in that he has a purpose for you. He knows our purpose, and because he knows our purpose, he knows how to perfect us, and he is doing it and displaying it. Uh, of course, I object here. Stop. You know, I'm not King David. I do not have the purpose he had. I do not have the life he had. I'm not the son of Solomon. David was king of Israel. David would be the ancestor of Jesus Christ, who would be the very son of God. That's not who I am. But, listen, if I trust in God, if you trust in God, then are you not one to, for whom God sent his very own son? Aren't you the one? Aren't you one for whom he sent his son? Did he not send his love and his faithfulness to you? Has he not dealt with you in a marvelous and merciful way? When you become sensible of his presence and you cry out to him, he says to you in effect, come on in. Come into the throne of grace. Come to me because I am I am the one who rewards those who earnestly seek me. You see, when you, when, you, when you know these things about God, when we know he is our refuge, we, we f not only do we be begin to have useful information about ourselves and about the world that we can actually put into practice, but we also know now the only place that we can really go when we're in trouble, the only place that we can go, regardless of our circumstances, that we, have, we know him as our refuge. And he has demonstrated that by sending his love and his faithfulness to us in Jesus Christ, our Lord. So if you look upon the cross of Christ for yourself, why not look upon everything else? for yourself, that God knows who you are, that he understands us better than we could ever understand ourselves, and that uh, every difficulty, every cross, if I could put it that way, every blessing, every joy, as God perfects you for his purpose, a purpose not that he had for David or anyone else that we might read about in the Bible, but the purpose that he has for you. We'll see you real soon on online again at ATLPC.